Two weeks later, hearing a funeral commotion in the front alley, I was surprised to learn that they were carrying this university student to his burial. I had seen him on the street a few days before. One of the boys said that as we were going out to preach a few days previous, he had offered this young man a tract, but he would not take it. I knew nothing of this conversation with the girl. About a month later, this girl was in a trance under the power of the Spirit. After seeing visions of heaven and the glories of the redeemed, she stood still and bent over as though looking into hell. This is what I heard. Ah, there is hell. No, I cannot. I have no power to help you now. You certainly are in an awful plight. It is you who are worse than a beggar now, all dirty, all filthy, and suffering in the lake of fire. In fact, you look worse now than any beggar I ever saw. I thought you told me you were rich and that you had a great education. Where is your education now? Well, I cannot help you now, even if you do apologize. That may be, but I have no power. No, only Jesus can save you, but when I told you about him, you made fun of him and cursed me. Look what we beggars who believe in Jesus have received in heaven. All is joy, all is happiness, all is love in the city of golden streets, with its wonderful paradise of God. The righteous scarcely saved. Then the girl seemed to be crossing the lake of fire over a narrow bridge. We saw her walking as though she were walking a rope, placing one foot carefully in front of the other, while extending her arm on either side until she recovered her balance. With a sigh of relief, she said, My, this is dangerous, but the Lord will help me. I will get across to the other side. Then she carefully brought the other foot forward and nearly lost her balance again. She praised the Lord until she recovered her balance and proceeded as before. In this way, having crossed the room, she seemed to be safely in heaven, past every danger of ever falling into the lake of fire. Whatever the effect of relating these visions may have on others, these things have taught us in a dullum to believe more assuredly than ever in the reality of heaven and the kingdom of God, and the reality of hell and the kingdom of the devil. More positively than ever do we assert that the way through this life that leads over the dangers of the lake of fire the way that overcomers must travel is like walking a rope, which must be traveled step by step with fear and trembling. Only the Lord Jesus can sustain us in the balance, so that we may not topple in to the right, or escaping that fall to the left. We are surer than ever that God means for us to stand by the cross at the crossroads, to point sinners to the narrow, little-traveled road that starts at the cross and leads by it on up to heaven and the life the Lord has prepared for them who love him. How can any be saved without this salvation? How can any escape who neglect this salvation? For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Hebrews 2, verses 2 through 3. Chapter 8. End of this age and the return of Christ. During the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, by vision and prophecy, we were repeatedly warned that the end of the present age and the return of our Lord is at hand. The Holy Spirit made this great climax at the consummation of the present age so vivid and real that no doubt was left in any of our minds that the Lord God was bringing last and supremely important messages to His people. The Scripture teaches that the great present age will end in the greatest tribulation the world has ever seen, and that immediately after that tribulation, the Lord will return to destroy the wicked and reward the righteous. The scriptures also teach that this age will reach its climax at its end, in the harvest when the tares will have reached full fruition, and when the wheat will have passed from the leaf and the blade to the full grain in the ear. When both the wheat and the tares are ripe, the angels will come with the Lord to gather the harvest and to separate the wheat from the tares. In other words, when the kingdom of the devil is at its worst, and the kingdom of God on earth is at its best, in its purest form, the evil ripe and the good ripe, then will come the harvest. The Bible further teaches that evil will reach its climax in the incarnation of the devil, in control of a demon-deceived and tormented world, and that this devil-possessed world ruler, the Superman, will be destroyed by the Lord at his coming. There may be those who take exception to the above remarks, but, without detailed discussion of these matters, I will relate, as best I can, 
the visions and revelations given Adullam children, who knew little or nothing of the theology involved. Pestilence and Wars Time after time they spoke in prophecy, saying that a time of famine, pestilence, war, and desolation is coming, and that it will be attended with persecution of the people of God, whom he will especially equip and protect in this crisis. One boy saw our school teacher trying to buy a measure of rice. So great a crowd surrounded the granary that the teacher could only hope for success in making his purchase by pushing with the crowd. Only one measure of rice could be bought by each man. In vision, one ignorant, uneducated boy was transported to our civilized lands and saw the peoples getting ready for war, making bombs, cannons, and implements of destruction. The coming of the devil and his incarnation in the Antichrist was prophesied many times, as well as seen in vision. Visions of the Devil and Antichrist The children saw the dragon, the devil with seven heads. One boy saw angels, fighting with him, and seven of his angels. The devil and his angels were overcome and flung out of heaven to earth. Adullam boys saw the Superman the world is wishing for, the great subject of worship that Buddhism, Theosophy, Mohammedanism, and other religions expect. In him they saw the devil incarnated as a handsome strong man, in the beauty and strength of young manhood. They also had visions of the image that in due season this God-defying Antichrist will erect, according to prophecy, as an object of worship, the image that will be able to speak and to deceive the world. I asked how they knew this handsome man of power was the Antichrist. They said that a host of demons followed him everywhere, obeyed his every command, advanced at his word, and halted at his order. This Antichrist was also seen upon a plain as a beast with seven heads. Again I asked how they knew this was the Antichrist, and the children said the angels told them. I have already explained that, as to John, these revelations were given through angels when the children were in the spirit, in a trance, and that, like him, they carried on conversation with the angels, and by these heavenly messengers were told the mystery of many things they did not understand themselves. The Saints Under Persecution During the reign of this superman in his God-defying power, the saints of God were standing true and bearing faithful testimony in spite of every hardship and every danger. They saw the two witnesses in Jerusalem, and they saw the saints, as well as these two, endued with mighty supernatural power to fight with and to resist the power of darkness in that awful time, the like of which has never been upon the earth, the time when the devil and all his angels and demons will be turned loose upon the earth, having great wrath, knowing their time is short, during this time when no one but a true spirit-filled saint could stand for a day against such satanic power and supernatural satanic miracles and manifestations, the children saw the saints filled with the still greater supernatural power of their God, the spirit of him who is greater than he that is in the world. They had visions of preaching the gospel in the midst of great persecution, but they were given such power that by a word from them, enemies were smitten by plagues or death. This power seemed to issue from within and came out of their mouths. With it they rebuked and slew their enemies. They were exercising the power the Lord had promised his disciples, power to do the works he did and greater works. In some cases, after giving a testimony in a town that rejected them and having left it a distance, fire from heaven descended and destroyed the wicked place, even as Sodom and Gomorrah were swept away. When persecution was bitter, they were sometimes caught away bodily by the Holy Spirit, as was Philip, and as the prophet supposed Elijah had been. 2 Kings 2, 16. They were thus by the Spirit carried away to a place of safety. In time of hunger and need, food was miraculously provided. Manna, fruit, and other food. Angels ministered. Strength and boldness were given to bear a fearless testimony. The Christians had power to speak with tongues, in the languages of strange and unevangelized tribes. When in vision the boys or girls were thus preaching in the Spirit, we ourselves could see how this might be true. For while one speaker preached to the people of a strange language whom he saw before him, another interpreted for him. 1 Corinthians 14, 28. Both spoke in other tongues. One spoke a few sentences, then the other interpreted. They were preaching to some of those of every tribe and language. John saw an angel flying in heaven.